Ladies and gentlemen, with unemployment off the Richter scale, we got murderous hornets flying around. And yes, America is finally trying to open back up again. But these circumstances cause a lot of anxiety for us investors out there. And if you're like me, you might go to the tune of calling yourself a value investor, looking for companies that are out of favor but have incredible balance sheets, something like a Warren Buffett would do. But then we keep turning our heads away from those incredible growth stocks that could have taken our portfolio into all-time highs, where we look at our portfolio today giving us lackluster performance, I want to ask the question, is value investing dead? And I want to share with you some mistakes that I've made, even as of recent, that I'm trying to adjust in my investment strategies. I look so forward to breaking this down for you, so let's jump right in this. Drop it. the stock market realm. Let me update you on some of the terms we're going to be utilizing a lot in this video. Like what the heck is value investing? Well, simply it's a strategy that involves picking stocks that appear to be trading for less than their intrinsic or book value. Something Warren Buffett is famous for doing. And I believe this is going to become one of the most frustrating strategies for investors out there. Now, what I'm about to show you is extremely circumstantial on a case by case basis. But as a value investor, we would probably look at something like a Wells Fargo that just keeps downtrending based on news economic circumstances. And we might say to ourselves, hey, this company isn't losing as much money on its balance sheet as the stock is falling. So therefore, heck, might be a value stock pays a really high dividend yield. Let's buy into this. So you buy into it only to watch it dip. Then you start falling into your cost averaging habits where you're like, hey, it dropped. I'm down 20%. Let me buy some more and you buy more. And it drops and you keep buying more as you keep getting checks. And you're like, you know, I love this stock. It's cheap. Let's keep throwing money. And it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And then you turn your head over and you start looking at companies that didn't seem like value stocks like Apple, like Facebook, and they're starting to push into all-time highs. And then you start getting very anxious and annoyed, like, why am I wasting my time on these dividend stocks? Whereas if I just bought these companies, like my portfolio would already be in the green. This is what I call falling into the value trap. And I'm going to clarify this because it's something I'm an extreme victim to. But before I do, I want to touch base on this new trend, this nuanced thing many institutional investors, many dividend investors in the community are starting to catch wind of. What these investors are recognizing is this massive shift that is going on that I think started years ago, but now is finally starting to get concrete as the evidence just shows in something like an S&P 500 index, which is down 9% still on the year, but comparing it to something like the NASDAQ 100, which represents really expensive, you know, fair valued, if not overvalued tech stocks, which is now up 5% on the year. And taking it one step farther, take a look at something like ARK Invest that holds Tesla, Squarespace, I mean, some medical companies, and almost all of them aren't even profitable, yet this company is up more than the NASDAQ 100 is. It's up 20% on the year. So, I mean, this is making it quite clear that investors out there, institutional investors, they want growth in their portfolio, and they're willing to step into what the future might hold to get that growth. And it's something very unusual going through a stock market crash that we see something like financials really estate, all the typical sectors just get slaughtered. Many of you may recall an ongoing joke I was doing called Francisco Portuguese monkey with Russian accent, which essentially was a joke where I would have a monkey pick a bunch of random stock. Guys, so we're going to try and use them as though he is a dart because those are so tinily written. So we're going to go for first one. Bow. Okay, well, help if the monkey didn't turn around when I threw it. Be harder than I thought, ladies and gentlemen. Let's throw him ass backwards then. What about ass backwards? Will this work better? Maybe because I'm throwing him like this. Boom! Oh, but! And I would compare my portfolio performance against the monkey. Now, that kind of evolved over time, and I ended up just dissolving that portfolio to make a new portfolio with basically the top nine S&P 500 stocks. And I bought these just before the crash, and I'm finding it very interesting looking at it now only being down, you know, 7% against something like the S&P 500 index, which is actually down, you know, about 9 to 10%. Taking a look at these top nine holdings, it really shows this nuance in investing that people really want revolution. They want change. They want growth. And we're seeing that in companies like Amazon, Google, you know, Apple. These are the companies in Facebook that are holding up the whole portfolio over those value stocks like your, your JP Morgans of the world. So what does this truly say for value investing? Well, I honestly don't think value investing is dead. And if I can help ease some of your investing anxiety that I have personally gone through falling into these traps with companies like GEO Group with something like a Wells Fargo, and I'm still doing 
doing it with companies like uh, the real estate sector out there, like Rio Can, where it's all your focus starts driving into those couple of stocks and you keep cost averaging down into them only to realize your portfolio is going down with it and you could be experiencing some up potential if you just kind of step back from those value stocks. So I'm going to break down a super simple strategy that's going to prevent you from falling into this value trap, giving you lackluster performance in your portfolio and hopefully giving you somewhat stability or growth to compete against that basic S&P 500 index. Because if you're buying individual value stocks, your portfolio is probably definitely underperforming right now. And I want to prevent that from happening. But believe me, I do not think value investing is dead. In fact, taking a look at the Vanguard financials here, which represents a lot of the biggest financial institutions out there. I mean, this ETF is still down 30%. And taking a look at something like the VNQ, which is the real estate ETF, it is still down massively, roughly 25%. Like, I mean, they're just incredibly lackluster here, even compared to the basic S&P 500 index. And that's what drives us as value investors into these. So yes, even though I think many of the individual stocks that sit within these ETFs are incredible value stocks that I'm still buying into, I want you to have growth in your portfolio. And you have to recognize trends that might be going above your comfort level. And those could be companies like Apple and Facebook because they don't have high dividends. They're not very cheap, but they're going to actually offer you more stability than these value stocks are in this current market condition. Now, however, I still think you need to be buying these value stocks. I'm not saying completely turn your head away from them. Many of you are aware of what I call a 70-30 split where I focus on 30% growth, not really what I would call value stocks, but they're the stocks that are keeping my portfolio green on the year. And then I would focus 70% on value and dividend stocks, which are proving to be extremely lackluster in holding most of my portfolio gains back, but I still love them because they pay me that monthly dividend that allows me to buy different stocks, whether they be growth stocks or value stocks. But the biggest trap you need to stop falling into is that constant idea of having to cost average down and getting hyped into this one company. You need to turn your head and constantly look at the broader trends. And the way you do this without getting emotionally involved and overthinking it is by simply allocating funds to what you want to invest in. You're gonna have your growth fund, you're gonna have your value bets, and then you're gonna have your safe staple companies that, yeah, they might not pay the highest yield, they might not be the cheapest companies like your Cloroxes and your Johnson & Johnsons of the world, but those companies, I still think you have to have, and you need to get into the mindset of looking at things in a broad way of diversification. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and buy Tesla. Honestly, I can recommend really safe companies that, yes, they're not cheap with something like Facebook trading at a 30 times multiple, and it's not paying a dividend, but at the same time, time, I feel a lot of confidence that this company is going to be worth substantially more than a $600 billion market cap three to five years from now. Whereas with something like a Wells Fargo, though I love the dividend and it looks like it's very cheap, I don't know what the recovery is going to look like in the next three to five years. I mean, right now this company is out of favor. How long could it be out of favor for? I don't know. It could be a year, five years. Heck, it could even take a decade because, I mean, go back to the 2008 financial crisis. I mean, for more than six years, this company never returned. And that's something that you have to face when you're buying value stocks. And to avoid getting trapped in that six-year lackluster performance, I mean, you might be too afraid and you might just be buying the S&P 500 index. But in the same notion of that, in that index, you're holding all these terrible companies that are dropping substantially with those good companies, also giving you lackluster performance. Now, don't get me wrong. Wrong. I think everybody to an extent should have maybe an S&P 500 index in their portfolio but they should still continue understanding the trends in the market. And you need to approach those trends in, in a safe manner that fits your comfortability, right? And you can simply do that by buying a NASDAQ 100 ETF. And like I said, guys, I'm just trying to point you in the direction that's going to give you the best performance possible as I've been able to experience. Because like I said, I am green on the year. My portfolio is sitting around 140, 145,000 today. And I mean, I started the year at 130K. So I'm actually up 10, $15,000 on this year. And that was primarily due to buying Tesla. And that also primarily due to my holdings in Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. And again, guys, it's not exciting to hold those companies because they don't look like they're cheap. They don't pay high dividends. But in time, Times like this, when the trend is your friend, I feel a lot better about my portfolio and I feel bad for people that only solely focused on value and dividend stocks. And I'm hoping you're going to be able to learn from this as I have and realize the power of diversifying in trends, even though it doesn't make sense. You still have to realize you're exposing yourself to in some incredible companies and attention is where money goes. And attention right now, guys, is on Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, and that's where money is going to flood, not into your Wells Fargo's of the world. But don't mix the fact up, guys, that you need to have exposure to all of them. So stay cool, stay awesome, 
and I look forward to chatting to you. Oh yeah, by the way, hit that like button, but I'll chat to you tomorrow.